For those that appreciate self-defense, martial arts, learning, training, etc., and can appreciate someone that is a professional, you're going to enjoy this episode. Today we have on Mike Tomaselli, the owner of the Tomaselli Academy. And let me just say, and we'll get into this, he is so well-rounded, which has uh, attracted me to train at his school. I've been there for on and off for years. Mike is a fundamentally solid individual, well-rounded, and you can learn a lot from this individual. His philosophy is spot on as well. So without further ado, Mike Tomaselli, what's up, brother? Hey, dude. How you been? I'm, I'm, I'm all right. I'm alive. I'm here. How are you? I'm above ground still. Yeah, that's good. Hey, as long as you're not uh, fish food or worm food, it's all good, right? right nobody, and nobody wants to hear you bitch and complain, so... No, no, most complaints aren't even worth lodging nowadays. <laughs> All right. So, Mike, you, again, you're the owner of Tomaselli Academy. Awesome school. Uh, I, wa- I want to get into, you know, your upbringing, what got you into this martial arts journey so that people are listening can kind of compare notes or go, wow, I didn't think about it that way. Or if they're thinking to run a school. And then also, thanks to this freaking COVID pandemic BS, um, it's really important. You've been able to survive and keep your school going. So uh, I want to touch upon that too, because there's probably a lot of people out there running a school across the country or world that want to get your take as well. All right. So, and anything I bring up, if it's a uh, secret COVID or co- secret, all that crap, just let me know. All right. So sure. now, so Mike, you were born and raised in Maine, correct? Yes, sir. Small one stop light town on the coast of Maine. Uh, what was the name? What's the name of the town? Booth Bay Harbor. B O O T H B A Y. Booth Bay okay. Harbor. And what's the what's the roundabout population of that area? God, maybe in the winter, several thousand, and then it turns into a <laughs> tourist town in the summer, and it's times ten. But wow. that was where my first school was, Maine Jiu Jitsu Academy. I did not know that. So, what Maine Jiu Jitsu Academy? You had a school back there? So back in Maine, in my little one stoplight town. Aaron Blake, who's one of Joe Morrow's black belts today, along with actually probably nine other guys I started training with back in Maine, all got their black belts. But there was a little jiu-jitsu club, and at the time, I think Aaron was a brown belt. Everybody else was blue and purple belts, and I was lifting weights at the local YMCA and playing basketball every day. And my friend Dan Thompson, every day there was jiu-jitsu, would walk by the weight room, and be like, hey, Tom Sully, you want to come and do some jujitsu? And I'd look at him and be like, I don't need your stupid martial arts shit. I'm lifting weights. <laughs> <laughs> and he honestly probably asked me like 20 times. Every time I walked by the weight room, I just remember him asking me. And then on that 21st or 25th time, I was like, fine. I racked all my weights. We literally walked down the street or drove down the street maybe half a mile. And... There was a mat full of 15 to 65-year-old people just training, and I got the living shit kicked out of me on my first class. Did first we week, all? <laughs> probably my first month. To the, I got my beat up so bad that I realized that all of my sport ball playing and all my lifting was for naught because these guys who were – I was 240 pounds and like one of the strongest kids in my school, and – these little twerps were bending me backwards, breaking me, and it just, I found it fascinating, so fascinating that I didn't even get mad. I just asked them, how did you do it? And they probably got tired of me asking them constantly, how did you do that? But <clears throat> that's how it all began. And then Joe Moore awesome. came out and taught a seminar, and he uh, looked at me, and he's like, you don't really have a girlfriend, you don't have a house, and he pats, why don't you come to California and train some of my heavyweights? And at first I said no, and then he asked me two more times, and on the third time I sold everything I owned except my car and my computer and came out and stayed with Joe. Wow, drove out to California from Maine, right? Twice, but yeah, I drove Twice. out. I did the trip. And once, my original attempt, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I drove with a buddy from Maine to Florida to Albuquerque. And then in Albuquerque, I'm looking at – you know, the home stretch to California, and I got a phone call from my parents and my brother was in a car accident. 
Mm. So we drove straight back to Maine from Albuquerque. And that was the first postponement of my trip to California. Wow. And probably a couple months later, I just did it solo. I drove straight shot, three 18-hour days of driving or something like that. That's some dedication. Didn't let things, uh, you know, ultimately take you out from your goal of getting out here and, you know and being what? with it's Joe. Funny. I tell everybody this. I had a couple trips planned across the country that my friends were going to come with, buying plane tickets so they could fly back, and uh, they all bailed. So on the third time, I said, screw it. I don't need anybody. I went to Walmart, and I filled my passenger seat up in my Jeep Cherokee with neutral game bars, beef jerky, water, and Red Bull. And I called my buddy Pete in Colorado and said, I'm coming. I sold everything I owned that night right up till 2 in the morning. My dad came home. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm selling everything I own and I'm going to California. So I sold everything except my clothes, my computer, and my car. Stereos, BB guns, bedding, couches. Sold everything and just basically left. I think I left at 2.30 in the morning. My dad said, good luck. Call me if you need anything. Wow. And I headed to California. And this was in the 90s? Was this 90s? Yeah, this was 2006, 2005, 2006. Okay. I think it was 2006 because I remember two nights before I was supposed to leave, a deer, a buck ran into the side of my Jeep, and I had two days to get the door fixed so I could leave for my deadline, and it was February in Maine. And at that point, you, you were a black belt? No, nope, I was still, this was just, this was all in Maine. I was blue belt, maybe a purple belt at the time. Okay. But Joe just saw the promise. Sorry. Uh, so Joe saw the promise in you and you're a big guy. By the way, Mike Tomaselli has orangutan strength. I have sparred yeah. pojada, whatever you want to call it with Mike over the years. And the dude is like, I don't know how, what, other than calling it orangutan strength, unbelievably strong. I'll take it. And, but yeah, and then, but obviously he's very technical as well too. But that's that's classic um, the jujitsu. That's how I came about it too. All the way back, you know, I'm older than you, but November of '92, uh, I probably told you this, but a guy I was renting from in Manhattan Beach, California. Everyone listening, this is being done in California, uh, Orange County. I'm in Manhattan Beach at the time, LA County, and a guy comes in that I'm running from. He's a big dude. He's like six five, two twenty, like a thoroughbred, just lean, mean, and and tough and uh he goes hey been doing this gracie jujitsu i'm like what the hell is that and he's like it's grappling and uh it, it's insane you should try it i'm like screw you and he knew i love surfing skiing did basic karate so minimal boxing back in the day and he's like and i'm like screw you i'll just hit you or stab you with this kitchen blade or whatever he got a hold of me without saying anything slamming to the ground mounted me put his fist in my face and i felt like such a little bitch and I was like, oh, my God, you could totally go prison style on me. And I would I couldn't do anything. And, and then what so did we both do? We said, I want more. <laughs> yeah. And then we said, yes, give me more, please. Just not the bitch part <laughs> or the or the prison stuff. But, um, uh, yeah, because it was so humbling. And you and I are very similar that way where we wanted then. Oh, my God. Where did you where did you learn this? I want to go. And that's exactly what you just said earlier. Mike, <laughs> my light bulb went off. I was like, I said the exact same thing. I said. Sign me up. Where'd you learn this? I need to do this. And yeah, give me more punishment. And yeah, I took a lot of punishment for years. Um, and then I made my way from LA County to Orange County, same, you know, a lot shorter journey than yours, but it, it's a humbling experience. You know, you're a big dude, very strong. And you're saying how you could take those guys out because you're so strong. And then these guys just have the technique and finesse and, 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 you know, some strength too. And, and they take you out. It's a humbling experience. And the people, though, I got to say, I'm, I'm not patting ourselves on the shoulders kind of thing, but the wise people will realize our faults and try to rectify that and get better. And it, that goes along with everyone's, you know, you hear the comment that we've all said, get uncomfortable in your training. And that's what you and I both did. We got very uncomfortable in our training to get better. Um, so enough of that. But that that's awesome, Mike. So you you come finally after all that, and hopefully your brother came out okay from that car accident. And he was cool. Yep, he did. All right, good. So you finally you get out to California, and you are you staying with Joe or you land somewhere else? So 
I'll never forget. I was driving through Vegas in the desert between California and, and Nevada, and I'm like, holy shit, what have I gotten myself into? This is awful. It's dry. It's hot. And then I rolled up into Costa Mesa, and I'm on the phone with Joe, and he's like, come to this address. And as I'm pulling into Costa Mesa, I'm starting to see palm trees, and it's bright and sunny, and people are in T-shirts, and my mood's automatically just getting better. And the joke with my wife is, I'll never give up palm trees. You can keep all the pine trees you want. I'll never give up my palm trees. But I showed up to uh, Baran Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on Adams and Harbor. That was the first right. place I stopped when I got in. And it was pretty cool. I walked in. Ed Beneville was there. There was Joe. The whole crew, yeah. A couple other guys. And Ed just handed me a camera. They were shooting um, for Joe for Ed's instructional book. Oh, the Passing book, door. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of fun. I got my palm trees, got a little Hollywood camera experience all on my first day. And then I just never left. I, I think that's where I actually first met you was at James Baran's location. Yeah, it was that's actually. I, first, I was rolling with Pat or uh, Bennis or somebody. And I looked over and I'm like, who's this freaking orangutan gorilla up against the wall? And it, yeah, it was you. And then I, I just remember you were like super cool. And you, you always have this big smile, which is, which is nice. And, uh, it, you know, it makes people feel better about the beatings they're going to receive. Yeah. I mean, there's for any of those that have trained and done hardcore stuff and gone, as we say, vertical in your training, um, there's nothing wrong with having some dude you know, giving it to you. And he's also aggro, but it wears out if you want to keep training and keep relationships. Longevity is key and you can't train it, like that forever. That's right. So you, you go complete vertical. Obviously, now you're killing each other and you're not going to have any training partners. And uh, anyways. Uh, Mr. Uh, TTK, for those in the Sioc tribe, know what I'm talking about. So, uh, and that's the other thing uh, why I have Mike Tomaselli on. Mike, not only is uh, are you fourth now or third degree black belt? Fourth. Fourth. Okay. So, fourth degree black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but he's highly competent working with tools. And I mean tools from hammers, skill saws, building tools. stuff to to sharp pointy things. And what I really enjoyed with Mike is he got it. We were, we would do jujitsu and then we would go elsewhere to train with our, uh, Kali stuff, Sayak Kali. And Mike would still train at his place and bring Kenny in. And then later on in life, I was able to join in and they were always pressure testing what it would be if you got in a fight with a dude with a blade, blades, gun, heat, whatever. And I, I, I said, Mike gets it. Bingo. Cause you got, you got your jujitsu guys that are, they walk around like, you know, they walk around hunched up looking like a gorilla and have the ears and their way is the best way. And the only right. And they're, and you know what? I was kind of guilty of that back in the nineties. And then I wised up when some dude just teed off on me with some Muay Thai and I'm like, Oh my God. I think that's just part of the growing process though. You know, like I went through the same thing. I got my black belt from Joe. thought it was the greatest thing on God's green earth. And then I went to Marco Huas' school and I got punched before I could and kicked before I could do 90% of my grappling. So it's just right. an eye opener and it turns into the whole Bruce Lee, take what is useful, discard what is not. Mm-hmm. So how long did it take you to get your black belt? And that's, and, I, and that's kind of a vague question because it, it, you know what? It really doesn't even freaking matter to those that train, right? And there's no time frame. I'm just curious because, like, it took me, you know, I was a brown belt for five years. So everyone's a little different. I'm just, I'm just curious. And, again, it doesn't um, mean. I think, let's see, I started in end of 2000, so 2004. I don't know. I want to say it was, like, eight years for me. Yeah. Eight years, maybe a little less, but I was training. I literally lived with Joe. So I was either at Joe's school, James Brand, or Global Jiu-Jitsu with Gustavo and Marcelo. Right. Joe right. would never let me sit at home and watch TV on the couch. If he ever saw me sitting, he'd be like, go here and train. Go there and train. Or he'd be like, Mike, I have a 200-pound big boy. Come and teach a private lesson with me. So anybody over 200 pounds that Joe had, I was the dummy. So mm. I got a lot of private training from Joe, you know, on the receiving end of it, but I still got the information. You're still learning. You're getting free. You're getting free downloads. 
Has, yeah, and that's seen, no denying me. I was helping Joe out because he was getting older and, you know, he didn't want to be pushing big heavy bodies around all day. <laughs> that's exactly what I wanted to do. Right. That's that's sick. That's killer. Eight years. So my point is it still took you eight years in your training every day, probably three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever time. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, so for those listening that are thinking of maybe getting into jujitsu, now Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's almost like Taekwondo. We, we joke about that, how it's almost on every corner, like Taekwondo. So you got to, for those looking to get into a grappling martial arts, such as Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, just scrutinize where you go. I always tell people, know the coach first. Why? This is why I have Mike on. And really screen that coach first. And then maybe try and get a few lessons for a private, for, or excuse me, whatever, for free lessons so you can see their style and coaching, how they are receptive to you, and then make your ultimate decision. Maybe try a few places. So, because um, there are certain ones out there that you're like, and again, it, it's based on your temperament, right? Some people just want to go to a fight school. Some people want to just learn. Yeah, technique, some people whatever. want a co- competition school, sports jiu-jitsu only in a gi. Some people right. like Kenny. He needs more than that. He needs guys who are willing to throw weapons in with the gi, you know, <laughs> and just have some fun with it. But you know, most places aren't like that because a lot of people don't want to step outside of the box of their initial profession. They want to think that the thing they invested the most time in is the best and the greatest. When in reality, like I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the best and greatest foundation for all of your martial arts to be built upon. Um, it is not the end all be all um, because you have things like striking before the clinch. You know, you have knives, you have guns, you have long range weapons, you have sticks, you have, you have a lot of things that will change your focus differently than it would in sport Jiu Jitsu. Right. So you just got to be willing to evolve and, you know, keep training and keep, I mean, I'll never forget when Kenny came in. He had been to five or six jiu-jitsu schools before me, and he shows up in my front door. And for those of you who don't know who Kenny is, I'm sure he'll be on the podcast sooner or later. But He's been mentioned enough on, on, on certain episodes, so I, I think we're going to have to that, bring That's the, uh... my number one combatives coach, you know. Mm-hmm. And he, like Mike said, he, we pressure tested an ungodly amount. Like the things everybody sees on YouTube, we actually took and pressure tested with two guys, one that was 6'2", 240, and the other was six foot 240. And we pressure tested everything we did. I mean, now I'm not talking about fighting just on mats. We were over on the concrete. We had on our safety goggles. We went at it. But he came into my school, and he had on a Punisher hat, I think a <laughs> Punisher shirt, Army cargo pants. And I'm like, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? <laughs> He's just like, me, like – He's the meanest looking motherfucker you've ever met until you talk to him. And he looks at me and he's like, so uh, are you okay if we train with weapons? And I looked at him and I'm like, real ones or trainers? He goes, trainers for now. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And he just got this big shit eating grin on his face. He goes, <laughs> okay, runs out to his car, comes in with a giant duffel bag of, mm. you've seen it. Training mm. machete blades, aluminum trainers, sticks, you name it. Kenny has got a trainer for it. And uh, I think that was our first day. And from that day, we started training three, four times a week, almost nonstop for four or five years. Like it was incredible the pace that he was able to keep up, especially being, what, 20 years older than me? Oh, insane. So, uh, Kenny, we call him Kenny, Ken Smith, or his handle is the gentle juggernaut. That's, that's the pretty one. much sums up Kenny. He, he Kenny, you, you both you guys look like these freaking Nordic Viking guys that are these big, thick dudes. Kenny's fingers are like the size of sausages, <laughs> and 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 Mike's not far behind that. And for those, whatever, I won't go down that road, but anyway. <laughs> Big, strong dudes and going at it and doing realistic scenario-based training, which I absolutely love, which I started years ago with that SAS Def business. But that's absolutely what you got to be doing, realistic scenario-based training. That's the real world. Sports jiu-jitsu, okay, it's great, whatever. But, dude, uh, yeah. So you guys are pressure testing the crap out of things. Kenny, that's funny. He's such a little – he's like this – he's like this – 
this big dude with a little kid inside and he gets, yeah, it's funny. It's so neat how, and it, it's awesome how animated he gets and he turns into this little kid and runs in. He's all excited. It's like a dog with a tail wagon. And he's like, yeah, let's go. And that's, you know, pa- that's passion right there. I love training with guys like that. You know, it, it's positive passion. It, and yep. he wants to see people that he trains with excel as well. Cause then it helps them also. So um, Mike, that's why I have you on bro is because you already prefaced it. You get it. You do everything. Sorry, I got trash guys outside the office here. Uh, if people are picking that up. Um, you literally have a black belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And this is where I was going. So rewind all the way back where I started. Fourth degree black belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And you have a black belt in Marco Huas Valley Tudo. I think he calls it Valley Tudo, but it's a Brazilian version of Muay Thai. Is that correct? Yes. And, okay. So for those that don't know Marco Huas, look him up. That guy is freaking gnarly and he's what upper fifties. And I, I think I would want, I, I think I'd want two full mags and a backup 45 and lay him apart. To t- I would not want to go toe to toe with that dude. Gnarly. I mean, yeah, he's a, um, he's a he's beast. Definitely one of a kind. That black belt took me a lot longer to get. That was probably 14 years to get that one. Wow. But, I wasn't training with him as exclusively as I was with Joe, even though his style was the only style I was teaching. But bringing Marco, like I tell everybody, people don't realize that back in the day, Marco and Joe fought in UFCs like two, three, four, five, six, something like that in the beginning. They were the two guys that originally decided, hey, I'm going to teach you my style. You teach me your style. Instead of having the uh, the Luda Libre Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu rivalry, these guys were two Brazilians that were rivals in Brazil, and they came here and they started training each other. And that, in my opinion, was the original mixed martial arts. Because meanwhile, the Gracies are winning the UFC, right, with their style. Yeah. And their style, as we've seen, worked in the beginning when no one else knew what it was. And then after everybody started to figure it out and started training it and started to acquire it, now the playing field was level. But Joe and Marco were way ahead of the curve with it. They started cross-training each other God, way back in the day, early 90s, right about those early UFCs. So oh, those guys, hey. I was always attracted to them. They're best friends. They're like, they're brothers. They're literally, they might as well be blood brothers when you see them, you know, they train, they're, they push each other like I've never seen anybody push each other, but they're joking and happy at the same time. It's like training with you and, you and Kenny, you know? Mm-hmm. Attitude is everything. You can push harder. And you can do more and you can throttle up more with a good attitude. Absolutely. And, and so for those listening, having a good attitude, energetic, positive, enthusiastic, that is what Mike is. And that really does go yards out when you want to try and learn several martial arts. And again, so Mike has a school that covers Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai. Not only is Marco Huas there. You have Dave Jansen, who's a master yeah. at Muay Thai, straight from Thailand, who's a bad mofo, who knows his stuff. Amazing individual. I mean, I took two and a half years of a beating direct from him with privates, but improved my game big time, uh, improved my jujitsu. So for those that are doing just straight grappling, you might want to get into some, some stand-up, some blade work, whatever. It will improve your jujitsu big time. Um, so Mike also has boxing with Tommy wish with Morgan, uh, uh, classic boxing coach. Uh, what else, geez, what else you got? I mean, obviously wrestling involved in there. Judo. Uh, am I missing anything? No, judo is the next black belt. I want to get, that's, okay. that's my well, hat trick. Well, you had Mike, uh, um, was it Mike? I'm, I'm Mike missing Mello? the name. No, 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 not Mike Mello. Um, oh my gosh. The judo black belt. Um, at the old school, when your school was on Newport Boulevard. Oh my gosh! Hello, um, <laughs> am I missing the name? I'm doing the name the name wrong. Um, Gary, oh, you're thinking of Chris Pizzo. Yeah, I'm sorry, my bad, Chris Pizzo. Yeah, he my never bad. wanted to rank anybody. And Chris, if you're listening, <laughs> my bad, brother. Um, ah, gotcha. But uh, but at least never... you did have a black belt in there showing you you know serious judo. Oh yeah, and, and for those who don't know, Joe Moreira, I think he's supposed to be a fourth or a fifth degree judo black belt. So that's, that's where true. the root of my judo came from. And Joe was one of the that's few true. Brazilian guys who left Brazil and went to Japan 
I stayed at Judo University and competed in the Kano Cup, which is a relatively prestigious Judo Cup, and I think he took second. So Joe immersed himself in the Japanese culture and the, judo, the martial art known as Judo. And that's, that was that's a correct. big thing with Joe because Jiu-Jitsu was mostly groundwork, right? So unless you had wrestling, you had to have Judo. So that was one of the gaps. And then the third gap Joe filled was, you know, getting the MMA from Marco. Mm-hmm. And so for those listening, uh, Joe Moyer was, is this amazing. Is he 10th degree now? He's 10th, right? Ninth. Red, no. Ninth. Isn't he Eighth. Eighth, Eighth degree whatever. Uh, Black and red belt. Black and red belt, straight from Brazil. Uh, amazing tactician, but tactician, is that right? Anyways, I'll edit that out. <laughs> He's amazing uh, uh, black belt in jiu-jitsu from Brazil, but also amazing stand-up, fought in the UFC. Marco Huas was a heavyweight champ in the UFC. And so Mike has had amazing talent at his school. Uh, Mike, why don't you um, let people know where your new school is? that want to check you out. So the new school is about seven or eight minutes away from the old one. It's in on main street in Santa Ana, two, five, three, seven South main street. It's um, right off the 55 freeway, maybe four or five minutes, but you'll see it green building on the side of the road, big sign that says fight school. Absolutely. Can't miss it. And so you got a ring in there, a mat, private mat up front. You, uh, you have the Muay Thai stuff set up in the back as well. Correct. Yeah, me and, and I, Dave are building our outdoor Muay Thai camp outside right now. So we got tires screwed on to wooden poles, and we'll have hanging tire bags. It'll be straight out of Thailand pretty soon. So we're still building, but as you know, I'm always building something at the academy, whether it was the last one we were at or this one. Always something to add, always something that we need, always something that people can use. Right. So that brings me, and congratulations for all your hard work. That's awesome. We went through this COVID thing. We still are, and it's up and down, yo-yo treatment. You were able to survive. A lot of schools probably went out of business. A lot of people weren't training, and then we had the quiet training. So um, I'm not going to delve into what you did to I, why don't you just give me a vanilla version of how you were able to survive for at least geez how to be at least a year right well well shit we're going on two years now well, well first, yeah the whole thing's going off two years but there was like that first hardcore year with like our first six months everyone thought they were going to get it and die and then we all yeah, learned and, shutdown. so yeah after about three or four days of that you know me being relatively well informed I kind of knew it was a crock of shit. I didn't see people like my own observations were not matching what everybody was saying in the news and what all the doctors were saying. I didn't see people dying in the streets. I didn't see homeless people dying in droves outside the academy. So after, you know, five days, I called a gym meeting and I just asked everybody, you know, who wants to live off the government tea? No one raised their hand said, who needs to work to pay their bills? And everybody but one person, you know, raised their hand. And you know, Kenny was there. I was there. Tommy, Chuck. So at that point, we just said, you know what? We're just going to teach under the radar. Closed up all the doors, all the windows, and made everybody park on the street. And I lost half of my school right off the bat. That's how scared everybody got from what they saw on the boob tube and on their social media. So I went from having the two best months I'd had in 10 years financially, most profit I'd ever seen, to knocked back about six or seven years, losing half my students. And at first I was kind of pissed. And then after about two, three weeks, other students started to hear about it and they started to come in. People who realized that their health was of the utmost priority and them not working out and them not doing but was a part of their lifestyle for who knows how long of their life. Some people, their entire lives, some people a few years, some people a few months, but you take that consistency and lifestyle away and you lock them up in their homes. Like that's not going to be healthy for anybody. So I rebuilt the school through the pandemic, you know, with more like-minded individuals and Right about the one year mark of the pandemic, my last building was uh, rezoned by the city of Costa Mesa 
for cannabis sales and distribution. So I had been in that building, gosh, almost 15 years, mm -hmm. 07, yeah, almost 15 years, 14, 15 years. And uh, I talked to my landlord about it and it basically he had a goose egg, you know, that turned into a golden goose egg overnight. And the amount of rent that he was requesting from me was five times what I was paying. And he ended up getting 10 times. But to my landlord's defense, solid Christian dude. Every year that I was at that building, he donated every single penny of rent to charities, church charities, third world countries, you name it. Oh, so wow. Didn't know that. When I said, when I talked with him, he's like, look, Mike, he goes, I prayed on this. And I just asked him, I was like, how much did you get? Cause I know what it was zoned for. And he told me, and I just gave him a high five said, congratulations. And you know, on to the next building, you know, and he's a, he's a pretty solid Christian dude. So he goes, nothing new under the sun and nothing lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So it was time to move. And, um, we just looked around and we looked, the hunt was on and I ended up finding a building within seven minutes that actually put me closer to most of my students. So it was good. It was a newer building. Um, the other building, it was big, but it had a lot of problems, a lot of problems that needed to get fixed that weren't getting fixed. So the new location turned out to be kind of a gem for us. Awesome. Any any leaking problems from the rains on like on like the other place or or no the roof say that all again? up the o other place when you say there were issues you know obviously some circulation periods when it got really hot but then all also that when the rain would come you'd have, you'd that have some roof leaking would leak problems. like a sieve at the old place right we'd have pots and pans out and now the new place is solid awesome very good much more solid and we have air conditioning and heat at the new place. Oh, you have AC. Nice. Yeah, I'm not going to turn it on, but we have it. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I know. AC. We don't need those freaking AC uh, badges. We don't know badges. Uh, that's awesome. And for those listening, when Mike said he doesn't believe in this or that, Mike's a very astute, smart individual. And he's very savvy as far as researching and searching out information all over the place and formulates his own opinions. And that's what everybody should do. So if someone's poo-pooing on what Mike said earlier, Mike totally believes, yeah, it's a real virus. But if you guys aren't clued in nowadays of how to treat that, I suggest you pull off the news, pull off your party and listen to the real doctors that are treating thousands of people properly so they can survive or they can treat it properly and not get to a worse location. Now, obviously, certain remedies or s shots or whatever are needed for certain po people of the population. I get it. And you're listening to someone speak right now who's dealt with his wife with horrible long haulers. She's one of the worst long haulers out there. And it's really turned us upside down. So I am very humbled by this stupid freaking virus. But uh, so anyway, I'm just throwing that little disclaimer out there that we take this very seriously. Uh, but Mike has done a wonderful job with his business surviving something that has literally shut a lot of people down. And so if people are out there that own a gym and that could be whatever, cross, you know, martial arts training to core training, whatever floats your boat, you might want to pick Mike's brain about that, how he's doing that. So that's why I brought it up. Anyways, I'm going to get off my soap dish here, soapbox. Uh, so Mike, do you have any plans? I, I, I did speak to Dave Jansen a while back. He's talking about how maybe, a, and, and you as well, having a portable ring or something in the back and have some fights or some Muay Thai fights or. So we've shifted gears a little bit right now. We're probably going to be looking at opening a second location six months into the year, hopefully June or July. Um, that location will be exclusively me and Dave. Really? Yeah. Wow. We'll still keep this location, but this will be more for the smaller classes, the private training. And we're still going to pack this place until that day comes. But um, I've got a building I'm looking at over on Old Newport Boulevard that's a little closer to the beach than the... Uh, the last Dude, you're building up, and you're back, you're back up in my hood. Yeah. But this one's 4,800 square feet and I've got a good, you know, I've got a good hookup on it, but 
we need a big box building, me and Dave, to really expand. And we're already packing our Monday and Wednesday night classes and his Tuesday and Thursday Muay Thai classes. So we're going to be ready in six months for a second location. Awesome. Epic. And yeah, again, so. Dave Jansen, OC Muay Thai, Mike Tomaselli, Tomaselli Academy. What a combo that is. That, <laughs> and, and, and that's what we're just talking about right now. You, obviously, For years, me and Dave people. tried to get working together, but like we just couldn't. We had our own schools, and we couldn't figure out a good schedule. And then he was coming in when you were training, and then he had his medical issues with his back, and then uh, uh, didn't see him for a while. And he walked into the front door of this new academy – maybe three or four months ago. And I just looked at him and I was like, he was hobbling in, barely walking. And I just looked at him and was like, are you fucking ready to teach yet? And he just looked <laughs> at me and he didn't know what to fucking say. So he's just Aww. like, yeah. That's like, awesome. Talk about another fun, jovial, enthusiastic, great human being, Dave Jansen. Oh, awesome. yeah. but, actually, but also That was gnarly. the very first guy I learned striking from. Oh, dude. That, Dave, me. we love you, but yeah. Oh my God. You, Dave is a classic martial artist. Oh, I mean, a professional martial artist. Yep. Been around the world, knows so much more than he la- leads on. But if if you ever see Dave Jansen, you look at him, just like when I first started doing jiu-jitsu with Hoist Gracie back in the early 90s. You look at these guys and you're like, oh, I could take that guy out. And especially you look at Dave and you're like, yeah, I could take Dave out. Oh, my God, dude. I that Oh, my God. I've never been hit so hard before. That, That's and because he knows how to hit. He knows that how to hit. All the that, other gorillas out there that are oh, just swinging cinder blocks for the fences. Yeah, so precise. And, and dude, his kicks. Ooh, I think he popped my right knee. He popped my back. Dislodged. It felt like my neck went another direction. I was, yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's – congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, and for those wondering why we talk about him walking and hobbling, and they basically saw Dave in half. He had a tumor on his in his spine, and we were fortunately able to remove it because that was going to be a bad day for him. So that's good. And he's come back, and, and Mike and him are rocking. And, uh, yeah, I, I can't – that would be awesome, Mike. Uh, that would be sick. Wow. Well, congratulations, Miguel. So again, you you sent out your address. Any other thing you want to blast out? How people can get a hold of you? Want to train at your school? Nope. Just check out the social media, Thomas Ellie Academy. They'll be able to find it somewhere, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or the website. And, and I give everybody a free week so they get to try it before they buy it. There you go. And for those that are uh, spelling challenge, you want to spell out your last name? T O M A C E L L I. Tomaselli Academy. Perfect. I highly suggest anyone listening, if you are in the Orange County, California area, or even if you're in LA County, San Diego County, you can make the drive up or down. Get with Mike Tomaselli, extremely well-rounded individual when it comes to self-defense, personal protection, martial arts. The man knows his stuff, and he's very versatile with tools as well. As I'm looking in his backdrop, he's got a lot of blue t- toys behind him and uh training blades all the goodies is that a screwdriver what is a little ice pick uh anyways mike is very open to uh what your personal self-defense goals are and he can custom tailor that to whatever is keeping you up at night to help you feel better about yourself and more confident about right you hit it on the head perfect well mike i appreciate you coming on thanks bro i know you're busy and you got some more classes coming up Uh, I hope to see you soon and uh, get some training in. Until then, have a great day, brother. Thanks for having me on, senor. My, My pleasure. Take care, bro. Later, dude.